Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our Meet Your She Hero event with Toyota Autonomous Driving Engineer, Sarah Kohler. I wanted to make sure I said that exactly right. We're delighted that you could join us today and we're looking forward to a really fascinating conversation about these you know, self-driving cars and artificial intelligence and sort of the, the way that the future is going. Before we get started though, I'm gonna turn things over to our board chair, Dr. Sophia Yen. She's gonna tell you a little bit about She Heroes and then we'll come back to me and we'll start asking asking questions. A little bit of housekeeping first, we have a chat bar running on the side and we encourage you to ask any and all questions of Sarah that you can possibly think of and just simply type your question on the chat bar and then I will uh, read it out to Sarah. So Sophia, over to you. All right. Well, I want to say thanks to everybody for joining and uh, some of you have heard this story several times because this is your second or third she Heroes event, but She Heroes was founded by three MIT alumna, two of which were Alpha Chi Omega sorority sisters, one of me and Judy Wong is not a co-founder, but also a Kayo on the call, have to acknowledge it. And then um, it was founded because my sorority sister, Sue Nagel, had a seventh, seven-year-old daughter, I think at the time, and she was like, mommy, mommy. I want to see like a woman physicist because her dad was a physicist and she's like, I want to see a physicist. And so they went online and they Googled woman physicist and they got a boring paragraph on Madame Curie. And my friend back in the day was like, well, today we should be able to Google whatever profession and whatever, yeah, whatever profession we should find an excited female talking about how much she loves her job and how she wants you to be it too. So that's what today we're trying to do with Dr. Sarah Kohler. And we would love your suggestions in the chat of other people, other fields that you'd like us to hunt down some she heroes for you. So we are free online videos targeting third to eighth graders. And anytime there's a rainy day, anytime there's a downtime, if you're bored on a Saturday or Sunday and you need some educational content for your children, just pull up She Heroes and watch a She Hero. And it's not purely for third to eighth graders. We've got our alumni here, Sarah Young, who's now oh, gonna be a sophomore in college. So you are always welcome as part of the She Hero family to inspire yourself of all the women doing all these amazing things. And I just wanna you know, do a shout out for our executive director, Lori Nelson, who recently completed and secured a grant um, up boosting our STEM curriculum. So please tell any educators you know, go to our website and take advantage of this STEM curriculum that we have. And of course, to acknowledge our board member who you'll also hear from at the end, Dr. Michelle Krauss. Well, thank you, Sophia. So um, yes, just one, uh, one reminder, our new curriculum, it's the first ever for She Heroes and it's really, truly unique. We think that uh, middle school girls and high school girls, we think that uh, uh, every girl and boys will be quite interested in it. And it is free. So if you know teachers, please send them the link to our website so that they can share it. So now we will begin our program. So Sarah, it is so nice to finally meet you in person. Welcome to our Meet Your She Hero event. <laughs> thank you, thanks so much. And thanks for having me here. And thank you to all the board of directors for putting this on and, and bringing all these people together. It's a wonderful event to be able to participate in. Well, we usually like to start at the beginning because we're all always interested in how a young girl gets to be the woman that they are today. So can you tell us a little bit about what, where you grew up, your family, how many kids in your family, what your interests were? Yeah, absolutely. Let's start from the very beginning. Um, <laughs> so I grew up in Silver Spring, Maryland, which is a city just outside of Washington, D.C. And I grew up with two brothers. I was the middle child, so I had an older brother and a younger brother. And um, I am in a multiracial family because my mom is Japanese and my dad is kind of white American. Um, and yeah, let's see, my family, I was kind of like a shy girl growing up. Um, we had, my whole family was fairly on the quiet side, but I was particularly shy in school for sure. Um, like always kind of like hiding off to the side. Um, but I was really interested in math and, um, you know, I was that girl who was very quiet, but then like first girl to like get her times tables memorized. And so the teacher was like, oh, wow, Sarah's got the multiplication facts memorized first. And 
that was kind of cool. And so that was kind of, you know, yeah, I think that's in a nutshell who I was, who my family was, Washington, D.C. Washington, D.C. was a great place to grow up. I really loved that area. Um, there's just like, it's very, very diverse. It was very multiracial. Like my high school I went to had an amazing, like people from like 80 different countries attending this high school, like all over the, from all over the world. So I had friends from all different cultures and it was really cool. And I feel like that has been like the most interesting, diverse, like in terms of race, I guess, um, area I've lived in my whole life. And now I live in California though. So obviously not in Maryland anymore, but that's a little bit about me. <laughs> well, I have a question for you on the math, on the math side of things. You know, we, one of our she heroes is a uh, mathematics professor at Loyola Marymount. And she was telling us that the way that she got into that was that she, as a child, she absolutely loved solving puzzles. She was just crazy about puzzles. Did you have the same kind of thing? Because I'm thinking that that kind of mind sort of gravitates into the direction that you ended up in. Yeah, for sure. I definitely like puzzles. I like doing like problem solving kind of things. And um, like, I guess maybe not as a super young girl, but like in high school, I was on the math team. And that's all about like, you know, getting together and solving problems and doing that sort of thing. Um, and <laughs> I still awesome. love puzzles now. So... <laughs> What, were you the only girl on the math team? <laughs> or did you? I think there were occasionally at least one other girl, but yeah, it was usually a bunch of guys. <laughs> I can imagine. I can imagine. Well, good for you. <laughs> so so um, now did you, I mean, you're an engineer today, but what did you think mm -hmm. you were going to grow up and be when you were, when you were younger? Um, so I had no idea what an engineer was when I was growing up. Well, actually, I thought an engineer was the guy on Thomas the Tank Engine who runs the train. <laughs> so um, I didn't know what an engineer was until I was applying to college. And my mom was kind of like, hey, you should probably go into engineering. Um, so that was very helpful. But when I like was little, I decided I wanted to be an inventor because that's the only word I kind of knew for like creating new things and coming up with new ideas. Um, so I really liked, uh, I was really into like art stuff too, not like, not like drawing, but I was in, I did a lot of ballet as a child and like, um, I liked, I liked to knit. I just liked all the creative things in addition to like math as well. So somehow like the creation side of me plus like the math side meant, oh, I should be an inventor. And I feel like that's pretty close to what an engineer is. <laughs> so I think I actually achieved that dream. <laughs> Well, where did you end up going to school? And, and your mom convinced you to become an engineer, but what were sort of your broader interests as you entered college? Yeah, I mean, still like in high school, all I knew was, oh yeah, I really like math. I mean, I was on the math team, so <laughs> hopefully I really liked math. And I really liked physics. And I, di I didn't really know what exactly to do with that, although I was kind of drawn to things that were a little bit more hands-on. Um, like just you know there were some types of math where it was kind of like oh you're just thinking about like very abstract math and it can get into all these like weird letters and like symbols and it, like it gets pretty pretty strange but like i really liked numbers and like seeing numbers and like playing around with those and showing what the, that they can mean something um so uh yeah so my mom helped me feel, figure out like oh a practical combination of math and like some creative creative side is like engineering. Um, so I went to Cornell University for my undergrad, um, and then for my and then I went straight from there to my PhD at UC Berkeley. So those are the two institutes that I've been at. Oh wow! Yay, go Cal! <laughs> go Bears! <laughs> go Bears! So uh, so then you graduated from college, and what were you thinking you were going to be doing then? Where were you trying to find a job in? this particular area or did you start out somewhere else? Um, so in college I was all over the place trying to figure out what to do. I'm actually like a very indecisive person so it was very difficult for me to like choose something um, but I was very fortunate in college to do an internship at NASA JPL. Wow. Um, so that's in Pasadena, California near Los Angeles and um, I got to do this really cool internship where I worked on this like robotic airship and so it's like you can imagine like this big airship balloon thing and you know I, I got to deal with like some of them uh, it's called dynamics modeling so it's a bunch of math to kind of like describe how it moves um, 
And I just thought that was like the coolest place in the world. And I learned then that like, oh, if I want to do something like this for a career, I need to like go get a PhD in robotics. So that's when I kind of figured out like, oh, okay, I'm going to go straight to grad school and pursue a PhD basically in robotics. Um, and then that's just kind of how I ended up. <laughs> well, was the, JPL, was, was the JPL like a life-changing experience? I, I have a very dear friend who is one of the engineers there working on the thermal systems for the next Mars something mm. or other. And he reminds me every day that they are the finest, sharpest, most brilliant minds in America. <laughs> and that it is just the most rarefied atmosphere that you would ever imagine. But I can't imagine being a young intern in the midst of that milieu. What was that like? Uh, yeah, it was a life-changing experience. I mean, not only because my project was really cool and fun and like, I got to go out in a desert and like test an airship and like fly it around, help fly it around and stuff. Um, but also I was there um, when they were bringing up, I think it's Curiosity. I'm losing track. There's so many Mars rovers now. <laughs> There's Curiosity, then Opportunity, then, uh, yeah. So um, this would have been in 2010 that I was there. So uh, when I was there, they were bringing up that robot and I saw the wheels move for the first time. So it was really cool because they just sent an email to everyone at NASA being like, hey, you can come down to the observation area. We're gonna be testing the wheels today to make sure they move. So like I got to see a robot move for the first time on Earth, you know, before being launched to space and put on Mars and stuff. So that was super cool. Just a really <laughs> fun place to be. Oh my God. Well, you know, and, and for today's girls, there are so many robotics teams. I mean, right now we're hearing all about the Afghanistan, mm -hmm. Afghanistan team that has just been so amazing. But um, I would imagine that robotics as a program probably didn't exist when you were in high school or did it? I think there were some schools like in my county that had it, but I think my school didn't either have it or it started up right when I was graduating. So it wasn't really there. Hmm. Yeah. But what do you think about robotics in general for girls? Would you encourage them to get involved? Absolutely. It's a really fun area because like there's so many different things going on. There's like the physical pieces that you have to put together. There's like the electronics that power everything um, and like connect to sensors that can see things or motors that can make things move. Um, and there's just like so many different pieces of it. and it's so hands on and there's like tons of like robotics. There's like first robotics is a big robotics competition that I think young, you know, people in high school work on that sort of thing and come together and compete. I think it's a really fun area. I would definitely want to do it if I were in high school now. <laughs> <laughs> I know I would too. And I'm, I'm not even that, that of that mind, but I think it would just be more fun than anything. So, okay, now, now we're all brought up to our current time. And so we're going to ask you, you have a very technical and very specific job. So first of all, I'd like you to tell us a little bit about exactly what you do, but then let's expand that into a, an, into a broader conversation about artificial intelligence and, you know, self-driving vehicles and, and where the future is going on, on all of that. Uh, yeah. Okay. So let's start specific. Um, so I work on something called control algorithms, which are a type of algorithm that can basically decide how a car automatically steers itself or automatically accelerates itself. So when an autonomous car is trying to figure out, like, I have to drive myself, right? Um, there's a lot of thinking, a lot of processing that goes on. And like from the top, you start with just like seeing what's around you. So that's usually called perception. So that's kind of like, and we can get into sensors and that like using these things called lidars or radar um, or cameras to kind of figure out okay i see things around me like there's a car here there's a lane here that sort of thing um and then kind of between perception and control there's something called planning which is kind of okay i see the cars around me um i'm gonna go in this lane and then turn left over here so kind of trying to figure out where you're going and then control is like the really last thing that happens in all the thinking which is kind of like okay I know where I want to go. How the heck do I steer myself to get there? Um, so that's basically like, that's the very specific part that I work on. And specifically I do both like those kinds of algorithms within the autonomous driving, like full self-driving car uh, type of, of setup. But we also actually work on advanced driving safety systems. We have this thing called Guardian, which is really more about uh, 
bringing like current safety systems, things like automatic braking, which is something that might happen, or like uh, ABS brakes, which is something that helps you prevent the car from slipping if you're like slamming on the brakes on ice. Uh, we're like trying to bring that up to like a more advanced level where like the car is really protecting you as a driver and not just like kicking you out and saying like, no, I'm going to drive for you. It's really about, um, you know, we want to help you be as safe as possible while you're driving. Um, and so that's kind of interesting to me because there is a human and a computer kind of working together. And I think that's kind of one of the most interesting areas of artificial intelligence is kind of this idea that, um, you know, we don't always need to just like kick the human out of the picture. We actually want, it's actually humans have very good skills for certain things that computers are not good at. So how do you get the best of both, work, both best of both worlds and really get them together? Hmm. Yeah. Well, and you know, we're, we're all wondering, I mean, how does any of this work? How does the car see, for example? <laughs> and what is, yeah, I yeah. we keep hearing about that. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's like a, it's a, okay, so LiDAR, I like to explain it as first, if you've ever seen a self-driving car, um, which I know in the Bay Area, there's, there's a lot of them, <laughs> which is where I am, but um, oftentimes they have this kind of like spinning thing on the top, and um, I, several friends were like jokingly referred to it as the spinning like bucket of chicken, so like, if you've ever seen like the like KFC bucket of chicken, it's kind of like exactly that shape and it's like spinning on top of the car. Um, so that's the LiDAR. It's not always shaped like that, but in a lot of cases it is. Um, and so what the LiDAR does is it actually, it's using uh, infrared light to see things. So what it does is it kind of basically sends out a bunch of infrared light rays, like all around it. So it's spinning because it's trying to get a 360 degree view. And so what it does is it, it like kind of spits out those light rays um, and then they bounce back. And what the sensor sees is like a bunch of tiny little points. And all those tiny little points are like in different places in space. And when you kind of realize it, like you put it on a plot, you can kind of see this thing called a point cloud. So, you know, if there's a car right in front of you, like a human, you know, we see, okay, yeah, there's a car. But what a LiDAR would see is like a bunch of points like that kind of take the shape of a car, if that makes sense. Um, so that's a LiDAR. There's also camera, you know, we all we kind of know how cameras work. We're all looking at me on a camera right now. Um, and radar is also another really popular one. Radar is, um, uses radio waves instead of infrared light waves, uh, is what LiDAR uses. So that's why they're kind of sound similar to LiDAR, radar. Um, but radar is kind of better for like long distance um, and, and, and it doesn't come up with like a point cloud. It's kind of like just kind of, you can see through like fog and water and it just, it's just, it's useful in different situations than LiDAR is basically without going into too much nitty gritty detail. Well, so I think that's all the ways the car can see. <laughs> well, that, well, that's very interesting. It, it makes me wonder whether car companies are really competitive in keeping all this information to themselves or whether, because this is like mapping our world, you know, and everyone's having to map the exact same spatial uh, uh, places and things. But, um, you know, we hear a lot in the news about the Tesla problems and how does, how are Tesla, how does Tesla operate? How does Toyota operate? What is the difference between the two? Yeah, so if I recall correctly, I think that Tesla uses mostly radar and camera and they don't use LiDAR at all. It, it, maybe they do in some cases, but I think their goal is kind of to not use LiDAR. Um, I don't remember exactly why. I think maybe it's, it's, there are some issues with using LiDAR on every single car in the in public, which is like they can, the light rays can kind of interfere with each other. So um, that might be why they're doing that. Um, but, you know, uh, most companies do use LiDAR because it is um, really helpful to kind of get a good first version of like things working. And there's not so many, like, you know, self-driving cars aren't everywhere, right? You know, there's not so many right now. Um, and I think the idea is that in the future, um, you know, this is like kind of a long-term project to get like really full, fully autonomous driving vehicles on the road. Um, I think in the future, you know, these things might adapt to have to like say, okay, if every car is really a fully autonomous car, like maybe we can't have lighters on all of them. But, you know, it depends on the company what their approach is. Um, you know, at Toyota, we certainly use a combination of all these things. Um, and we have like, 
you know, we have a whole machine learning group, which I'm not part of, but they do a lot of research on like kind of how to best use each sensor and like um, use what's called machine learning to understand the data coming out of all those sensors and get the best information. Because um, I think the thing that really differs between each company is like, you can buy the same LIDAR equipment, you can buy the same radar sensors. I mean, there are different options, but like taking all that information and making sense of like, oh, all these dots in front of me, that's a car. Or like, oh, those dots are a pedestrian. Like those algorithms, they use machine learning to kind of decide that. And that can be, that's a lot of work. And that's like where a lot of the differences will come between different companies, basically. Hmm. Well, you know, it certainly seems like the wave of the future. What, what does everyone uh, feel like my, people that you work with and people that you know, does everyone feel that this is safe technology? <laughs> you know, I, if I saw, a, a, you know, an 18 wheeler truck driving down the freeway <laughs> with no driver, I would be terrified personally. <laughs> That's a really, really good question. I feel like it's often not the emphasis of like what the media, well, Sometimes they'll like really talk about how they're not safe, which is, you know, you'll see all the car accidents that do happen. Um, but I think most of the time it's like, oh, if there's another self-driving car company. Oh, look, they're already self-driving. Like, wow, it can drive itself. And I think what we're realizing across all the different companies working on this is like, it's pretty easy to like um, come up with an algorithm for a car that can basically drive itself, stay in a lane, change lanes, turn right, turn left. Um, pretty much everyone is able to do that, but the hard part, the really hard part, is how do you make sure that that's safe and reliable, like, all the time? Um, and that's something that uh, I'm personally very interested in. <laughs> um, and I think at TRI, we're specifically addressing this by, again, this thing called Guardian, which is, you know, um, most companies are just trying to do fully autonomous driving, so take the person out of the steering wheel and just let the car drive itself. But what we're doing at TRI is we're working on Guardian before getting to Chauffeur, which is kind of like, again, leveling up those safety systems like automatic braking, um, uh, lane keeping assist, leveling those up so that it's more like the car is guarding the human rather than in, if you go to like a Tesla autopilot, the human really has to make sure the car is driving okay. Like you have to be alert at all times, otherwise your car might drive into something and you might not be able to catch it in time, right? So um, I'm not sure if I totally answered the original question, but um, uh, I think safety is extremely important and is one of the hardest problems that we're still working on in this industry for sure. Well, I watched a documentary by uh, Werner Herzog called Lo and Behold, and it w there was a big segment in it about artificial intelligence and self-driving cars. The massive amounts of data that are being picked up by millions, exponentially, uh, you know, infinite points, uh, how does anybody manage all that information? <laughs> Um, well, uh, you know, we have to take advantage of things like cloud storage systems and like um, if you want to process lots of data, a lot of people turn to like really fancy computers. Um, like I think, I think Tesla has like a supercomputer now to help them process all the data. Um, but you know, like you basically don't have like a cheap computer <laughs> like running these algorithms. Probably if you look at the inside of like anybody's like autonomous car, it's got like some really beefy computers, probably a bunch of GPUs, which are, you know, a fancy different kind of computer chip basically. Um, and yeah, it's just, it's, it's, a, it's a hard problem as well. <laughs> well, it just seems uh, in, and the other um, aspect of that documentary is, is the artificial intelligence um, part of it, I found absolutely fascinating. Maybe you could talk a little bit about that because what I understand from that documentary is that the, the cars and the everything is getting smarter and smarter because it's feeding back into itself and educating everything around it to higher and higher levels. Is that what artificial intelligence is? And can you talk about that and how that's in the future of car manufacturing too? Yeah, um, yeah, I think your summary was pretty good. I think artificial intelligence is all about, you know, taking data from the environment and learning from it all the time. So it's not like you just take a, you just take a small amount of data and then you come up with an algorithm based on that data and you just see how it does. Like, I think that's kind of, you know, 
an older school way of developing uh, like self-driving cars, but it's kind of like every time you get new data, like there's some algorithm looking at it and saying like, oh gee, maybe we should adapt. Like maybe, um, you know, maybe this lane, we should really stay more onto the right side of it because on the left side, there's like a parked car. And so like, I should really like nudge away. Um, so like kind of, you know, the reason why we're driving and drive, like all these cars are driving all the time is we're trying to collect more and more data. And especially because you mentioned safety, like we're always trying to, you know, get capture all those tail end events. Like, oh, there was, you know, um, there was like a pedestrian who didn't act in a way that we expected. And so now we have like this new set of data so that we know for next time, um, you know, that pedestrian who's like standing in the street is like, you know, not actually going to walk. He's just standing there because, you know, sometimes pedestrians don't like to follow the rules and stay on the sidewalk, <laughs> like silly things like that. So, um, yeah, artificial intelligence is kind of a very, very broad term. And like within it, you know, I think machine learning is kind of like a slightly different part, like a, some people would say it's a subset, some people would say it's a different, depends who you ask exactly. Um, but uh, it's all about taking data and improving over time um, and learning like a human would do naturally. Hmm. Um, and, and you were just talking about this, but Sophia is asking, are any of these companies sharing any of this information? Is there any cooperative spirit amongst manufacturers? Um, it depends on what exactly it is. For sure, there are um, the robotics conferences and machine learning conferences that many of these companies publish. So like our company will publish at like the top machine learning conferences. Um, you'd have to be like NeurIPS and like uh, ICRA is a robotics conference. And so like, if you look into that, you can get into like very academic, like, you know, this is our approach. It'll like show the algorithms and that sort of thing. I think most companies do at least a little bit of that, but it's probably not the full picture of like everything that's going on inside like the brain of this car, right? Like there's, there's probably some stuff that's secret at almost a company. Um, but for sure there is some like, you know, and we rely heavily, I think this entire industry relies very heavily on like people in academia making and like researching and coming up with the latest and greatest stuff. Um, so we're all connected to like all the colleges and universities and all the researchers out there um, trying to get the best um, like new algorithms or new approaches out of them to use in our work. So it's not totally private. <laughs> Okay. Well, and now let's talk a little bit about Toyota. What's it like working there? Are you like amongst a few women or are there, is the pretty diversified there or, you know, how, how do you all work? I know it's a Japanese model of doing business because I have a brother and a brother-in-law who both work at Toyota. So I know a little bit about it, but tell us about what it's like to work there. Yeah, so Toyota itself is like a huge, huge company and it has many, many, many subsidiaries. And I work for Toyota Research Institute, which is a subsidiary within the United States, um, which has kind of like three different locations. There's one in California, one in Michigan, and one in uh, near Boston, Massachusetts. Um, and uh, let's see, my team, I work, oh, I'm very lucky. I actually work with uh, two other women out of what, we have five people on our team. So really impressive. I think I used to work for Apple beforehand and it was kind of like I was the only woman on a group of like 20, a team of like 20 people. So I think if you look around at like this industry, the fact that I have two other women on my team is like pretty astounding. Like, wow, how did you do that? So I think TRI has done something really, really right. Um, and I love that, that we've gotten that, um, that kind of representation where I am. Um, but yeah, uh, the Japanese model, uh, like you were mentioning, I mean, yeah, we do, um, we do like, you know, we do kind of our own research over at TRI, but we kind of are like, you know, obviously keeping in mind, like what is Toyota interested in and kind of, we have some themes of kind of, um, we want to develop mobility for all is kind of a theme that Toyota has. Um, and so actually TRI doesn't just work on autonomous driving. They actually have a bunch of other research areas as well. Like one they have is for robotics and the robotics division is really working on, um, like they've been really focused on robotics for elderly people, especially because in Japan, especially their population is really aging. And so having robotics to 
support those people in their homes. Um, and these homes are very small. It's very interesting. There's actually a really nice video of like the robotics work at TRI that you can probably Google and find on YouTube. Um, that, that's like another thing that's happening there. Um, and then there's oh, also- what, what does that even yeah. mean though? The, the, I, I love the idea of robotics helping elderly people. Is this like literally a robot in your house or just more mm -hmm. automated types of machines or something? No, it's like actual robots. Like one they had was a robot that like hangs from the ceiling. And it's, it's really cool because in like these Japanese houses, they're very small. And so like, there's not a lot of floor space, but there is ceiling space. So they kind of like have space to move around up there and they can come down and like open cabinets and help you reach things that like maybe if you don't have great knees, like you don't want to try to get down on the floor to reach something. So it's really uh, assisting you know, those elderly people or, you know, someone who might not have the able ability to easily access certain things in their house. Oh, that's so yeah. fascinating. So Toyota is involved in that kind of thing as well. Yeah, so that's a, another, that's a fairly large group at Toyota Research Institute as well. So the, the cars is definitely the biggest thing, as you might imagine, since Toyota's, you know, car company. Um, but robotics is also a huge part as well. Now, uh, when are you, do you have a prediction of when we will see fully autonomous self-driving cars roaming the streets? Yeah, I always get asked this question. I always have a very hard time answering it because uh, it's, the answer is, I don't think it's going to be for quite a while. Um, so like today, I think the most popular one that we see is probably again, like the Tesla autopilot. And there's this thing called the SAE levels of automation and it goes from zero to five and five is kind of, full self-driving like or full autonomy or uh, it's the levels of automation so it'll be a full automation um and so tesla pilot on that list is only at level two so level two means um like you still have to have a human guarding the car at all times um so there doesn't exist something above level two today um level three is kind of like uh, the car can drive for a while and then um you, it'll like ask you to take over when it doesn't know what to do. Um, level four, kind of, it'll always drive for you, but only in like a certain area, kind of like Waymo uh, drives only in Phoenix because it's like very, it's a very constrained area. Like you can't go just anywhere. Um, and then level five is like, it can drive anywhere. Like no assistance, human is not needed. So we're kind of at level two still today. And I think it's going to be, I don't know, I would say like 10 years or something as an estimate, but I honestly don't know. <laughs> well, you just mentioned Waymo, which we were talking about before, but for the benefit of some of our listeners who might not know what that is, what, what mm -hmm. is that exactly? Ah, so Waymo, um, they used to be the Google uh, self-driving car. And uh, so everyone knows Google and uh, they have like this division called, it was called Google X, now it's called X. And they do kind of these uh, uh, like very forward thinking projects. And um, they had the Google uh, self-driving car. And that was kind of like the first one, I think, that was around for a while. And so Waymo is actually just the next evolution of that. And they have these, they have these vans, basically. I think they're, I want to say they're Pacifica, Chrysler Pacificas. And um, they... Uh, they have a particular pilot with those plans in Phoenix, so you can request a ride on a Waymo van and it'll come pick you up. And there won't be a driver in the car at all. Um, there's probably somebody monitoring it, like remotely, like kind of like a remote control car kind of situation. Um, but there won't be anybody sitting in the driver's seat and you can just kind of get in and it'll take you to wherever you want to go in, I guess, the general Phoenix area. So that's what Waymo is. Oh, interesting. Well, now someone has posed an ethical question. If, um, let me see here. If it's you, the driver, versus a bus full of kids, who is the system going to save? I mean, it depends on the system, right? Um, <laughs> <laughs> depends on how it's like tuned, what it's learned about, like maybe it knows, um, you know, maybe it doesn't know that the bus has a bunch of people in it. Maybe it thinks it's something like a truck with a bunch of like just storage supplies on it or something. And so maybe it'll choose to protect the driver. Um, I think most of them are going to try to minimize, you know, I think this is what people want is to minimize any potential collision as much as possible. So um, 
you know, if you sometimes you have to crash. Like when I was taking my driver's license test and like learning that when I was a teenager, um, sometimes they said you just have to hit the deer. There, there were a lot of deer in Maryland, so they had, really had to teach us this. So I think like, you know, there are some situations you can't avoid. Like it's just not possible to always be safe. Like if the deer jumps out, um, the best you can do is maybe slow down as much as possible before you hit it. Um, so I think that's what, you know, I would hope most of these cars are going to do, but um, you know, I don't know everybody's approach. <laughs> well, it's, it's just a fascinating, um dilemma really i mean i think that's what's got most of us kind of nervous about this to be honest mm -hmm. and what are those sort of ethical questions that that toyota as a company studies in in regard to this kind of thing i mean you all must have to look at a whole series of sort of moral issues and you know it's not just technical logistical it's all different dimensions of humanity i think yeah actually one of the areas um, that I've actually been interested in um, is, is ethics and AI. Um, and there is um, a lot of studies showing, you know, the AI algorithm is only as good as the data it has looked at. So um, this is particularly interesting for things like um, facial recognition, where, you know, if all the data is, you know, predominantly, let's say, like white men it's not going to be very good at recognizing people of color or maybe women of color um and there's uh actually a really really good um an interesting kind of movie about it uh called ai ain't i a woman by joy Bu i think her name last name is like guala um but i would google ai ain't i a woman and she has this amazing video on it and it's really calling out like you know we need to have diversity in uh, people who work on AI so that we can recognize that our algorithms are, you know, having diverse data and like able to recognize different types of people. Um, and, you know, like she, in her film, she kind of shows like she's playing around with a bunch of facial recognition um, softwares and it's kind of like um, it, a bunch of them think she's a man, a bunch of them like don't recognize her because her skin is dark. Um, and so I think it's, it's this is something we've started talking about more recently, I think because of like um, research like this, that's been like, we need to make sure that our AI algorithms are really taking into account a diverse set of data so we can make sure that, you know, our cars are safe for everyone and not just, you know, some subset of the population. Right. Well, now, uh, what is Toyota going to specifically be making when they do make a, a self-driving vehicle? Is it going to be a truck or an RV or sports car? Or... Um, I'm not <laughs> sure that Toyota has publicized any of these things. I think, I think they have publicized that they are looking into all sorts of areas here. Um, so, you know, at TRI specifically, we're really looking into, you know, like a personal vehicle that could, you know, drive itself basically. Um, so that's kind of closer to, I guess, something like Tesla. But, uh, you know, I don't think trucks are out of scope. Or, you know, there's this idea of doing Moz, uh, mobility as a service, which is kind of more like Uber or Lyft, where kind of you, um, you might have a bunch of like robo fleet of cars and you know instead of uh like right now it's like somebody owns a car they become an uber driver and then they you know use the app to go pick people up like kind of the future of mobility as a service is that there will be a robo fleet and then that robo fleet will kind of just go um you know instead of the driver go pick the people up so that's another application of like autonomy um besides having like a tesla autopilot personally owned vehicle um, system and yeah, I'm not sure again of what exactly Toyota has come aside, but I'm pretty sure it's like we have done, we're investigating everything because <laughs> the future is anything, right? <laughs> and I don't mean to spy on you. <laughs> Time will all know. Um, here's another question. Uh, does a self-driving car have to be big to house the computer mm -hmm. or could it be like a one person vehicle? I mean, what are the limits on a self-driving car? <laughs> Um, well, you do have to fit a lot of stuff on a self-driving car. Like you'll see like Waymo or, you know, even in Tesla's like, it's pretty like, 
discreet. Like you don't see, there's no bucket of fried chicken on the top of the car, like I like to say. Um, but there are like little cameras and radars all over that thing. Um, so you have to have space for all the sensors. You have to have space for the computers. Um, and again, depending on like your algorithm that you design, you know, within the company, you might need more or less computers. So um, depends on which company, how many computers will be in there, but there will be probably something pretty beefy. Uh, the smallest thing I've seen, hmm, you know, we have a pretty small car called the concept car. I think it's the uh, LQ concept car. And that's not huge. It's like maybe the size of about a Prius. Um, so that's not huge, but a one person car, I'm not sure. No, I've seen some prototypes, but they're not super popular. Like, um, I wouldn't expect um, that to become a product that too soon. Isn't that called a bicycle? <laughs> <laughs> a bicycle. Yeah, why doesn't there exist a self-driving bicycle at this point, you know? <laughs> Might be easier. <laughs> so what do you like to do in your spare time? What's a, what are your other interests? Yeah, um, let's see. Well, I like to do yoga, um, partially because it's good exercise and like also good for like mental health and all those things. Um, and I love, since I live in the Bay Area, I love to eat food because uh, there's a lot of good food here. Um, and I like to go hiking as well. So just, you know, like, what did I, actually, I went to the Channel Islands National Park last week and it was really fun. We went camping and there's these cute little foxes there. Um, I highly recommend you guys check out Channel Islands if you can. <laughs> Sounds good. Yeah. So are you married? Do you have kids or are you? No, I, so I'm married. I don't have kids. Um, let's see. Yeah, I've been married for like two years. I live in San Jose. Uh, I'm trying to think if there's anything else interesting about that. <laughs> well, we put it out to the girls to ask questions, and I think we're we're kind of coming to the end of things, but I, I would love to hear your advice to young girls today who might be interested in doing what you're doing. Can you kind of give us a little handy guide that how they should look at things and which direction they might want to go? Yeah, I think uh, there's a number of things I could say here, but I think the one I really like is um, uh, like problem solving is really fun. Um, and so like, I think you mentioned puzzles earlier as somebody else's kind of like thing they got into as a kid. Um, I think just having, uh, you know, everyone has like kind of a natural curiosity about certain things. I think that kind of helps you guide you towards what is interesting to you. So, you know, maybe you're really interested in robotics. Um, and so, you know, maybe you're really interested in how like the little pieces go together. Um, you can like, I used to do this thing with kids where we would like go to like a recycling center and like take home some really cheap old toasters and we would take it apart and kind of figure out like with like a with a group of kids like oh this is the spring this is why it bounces or like this is like a latch for why the little button stays down here's the heating element so you could kind of take it apart and like try to understand it so like really having that curiosity and kind of like trying to figure out how things work, I think is how a lot of engineers get into this job, just kind of like, wait, so how does that work? And like, never like, you just like keep asking until like you like see the whole picture. Cause it's, it's something you can, you can do. You can like see it and touch it and feel it. So, um, you know, keep that curiosity going. <laughs> well, and yet you, you called yourself, or you said you'd like to be called an inventor when you were a kid. And what, what does that mean? Because that's really kind of applicable to what you're, what you're saying now. <laughs> yeah, I mean, as a kid, I don't know what I was thinking anymore. I don't remember, but <laughs> I feel like the idea was kind of like, oh, I really like building things, um, you know, like uh, when my, when I was very young, my brother got one of those little like model cars you could put together and you would paint it and all that stuff. And I was really, really jealous. And I was like, mom, dad, I really want to make this car too. So then I got to like, I eventually beg them into letting me do the like car putting together project as well. Um, well, that was kind of a prophetic little incident, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Now here you are working at Toyota. Does this mean that you've become what do they call them a gearhead <laughs> or motorhead or whatever? 
Um, I guess, I guess since I work for a car company, I would maybe qualify. I feel like I'm not the biggest gearhead that I know. Like there are people at my company who have like really nice cars and like, you know, are very interested like in like the mechanics of how a car works. And I'm more of a robotics and math person than a car person personally, but for, for sure there's lots of those people at my company as well. <laughs> Now we have a question from Sarah Young, but I don't, I can't uh, unmute her from my end. If it isn't too technical, I was wondering if you could talk about like a project that you're doing slash maybe you worked on in the past that you really enjoyed. Um, I thought was really interesting. Okay. Um, for me, I like anything where like there's a problem I have to solve and I have to like work with other people to figure out how to solve it. I think that it's actually the majority of the stuff that I work on is kind of like you get a problem and maybe you can solve it by yourself, but maybe you can't really like, like you don't know, like every single person who works at my company like has a certain area of expertise, but usually the problems that we get are kind of like multiple things combined. Um, so I really enjoy it when like I get together with those, a couple of other people, sit down and work on the problem you know, uh, maybe like, oh, the car is like steering weird in this spot. Like what's going on here? Um, and steering weird is pretty vague, but like you could imagine like, oh, it's just doing something that I don't expect. Um, and so then we look at the data, I sit down, we make plots, we talk to each other about like, oh, your algorithm is saying like, we should do a left turn, okay. And our algorithm is saying, okay, the steering should kind of go like this. Okay, and then like maybe there's some other piece of the system like the hardware is actually doing X, you know, it's like maybe it's the hardware like doing something weird or maybe the algorithm was like the planning algorithm was telling me something weird. So I think that, and this is like kind of broad and abstract, but like that's the majority of what I get to do is kind of think about that um, with other people and collaborate to solve problems. So that's like problem solving and working with other people are kind of like the two main things I really like to do at my job. Here we have one from Jennifer Cato. Where do you think is a good place to try these cars out? College campuses, smaller towns, etc. Hmm. I guess you could go to Phoenix and try Waymo. That would be easy. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's hard for most companies. They don't generally have like the public is not able to just get a ride. Um, so I'm trying to think. I think. Cruise might also be operating in San Francisco um, somewhat publicly or, you know, obviously if you know someone with a Tesla or can rent a Tesla, that's another one. <laughs> there's also like, um, you know, you can also rent like, there's tons of Tesla competitors like GM Super Cruise or I think Audi has an autopilot and so there's tons of things out there. What, what is Cruise, by the way? Sorry to interrupt. But. Oh, yeah. Sorry. I always forget that, you know, people don't just know all the autonomous driving companies. Um, so Cruise is an autonomous driving company based in San Francisco, uh, owned by GM. Um, and so they do a lot of driving around the city in San Francisco, which is pretty interesting and challenging because there's a lot of hills, there's a lot of traffic, it's a city, um, but they're all over the place there. So you'll definitely see them if you just go to San Francisco or, or Mountain View. If you just want to see them, I used to tell people, just go hang out in downtown Mountain View and for sure you're going to see at least one go past. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, we have time for maybe one more question before it's our time to wrap things up. Does anybody have any other questions? For what car do you drive? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I have a Toyota Prius. Um, because I also like have interest in like sustainability and that sort of thing. So I get really good gas mileage on that. Um, and you know, I work for Toyota. <laughs> so <laughs> as you expect, I drive a Toyota. <laughs> Does it have the auto park feature? Cause I couldn't wait for it cause it was going to take some extra time. But the, if you adults have not tried the auto park feature, it's like adult Disneyland to me. Like, Oh, we can park this thing parallel park for me. It's so cool. Wait, there's a car that does parallel parking for you? Yes. Oh, for The Toyota God. and the Beamer, I know. Yes. Oh, that's insane, but I need one. <laughs> you have to come back to California. <laughs> oh, Let's go God. to the dealership, test it out. Yeah. 
yeah that, wow what a great place. and another place that you can see these things if you go to techie conferences uh the manufacturers bring their cars in often and there is you know you sign all sorts of guarantees that you won't drive off a cliff and you get to go drive around that's when i when i was at ted i drove the first hydrogen car and boy it made me nervous i felt like i had an atomic bomb in the first generation in my trunk and God forbid anybody here or did you. But it's gotten better. So I can't I can't bad mouth that. But if you go to conferences, keep your eyes open for opportunities. Well, I just want to take a moment to say, Sarah, thank you so much. Uh, this has just been an absolutely fascinating conversation. I knew nothing about our subject <laughs> until we until we talked. And now I feel like I know a whole lot more about it. And I'm sure everyone else does too. So um, before we say goodbye, I'm going to turn things over to uh, Michelle. Over to you <laughs> for a few final well, Hello, questions. guys. Sarah, you make my heart sing. <laughs> Having gotten a PhD, another one sitting here, from Carnegie Mellon, and I was there when the Robotics Institute came to be. And I dated the man who did the first vision, artificial intelligence for seeing. And my other friends were doing hearsay, which is the ability to hear spoken word and to receive spoken word. So what you're doing is a dream come true. And I applaud that greatly. It's been a real treat to have all of you with us because I don't always get things that are so near and dear to my heart. But going forward, I'm supposed to be the person who closes and asks for future resources to keep us going. So if there's the opportunity and you can, or you have a corporate job that allows you to match, like Sophia's husband at Apple or whatever, we can take stock, we can take matching, and we are delighted to know more about each and every one of you. So come on down, tell us what you want. Let us know if you enjoyed this. I'm really sorry that we closed the chat or disabled it, but we'll get better. And I thank you, Dr. Sarah, for spending your time with us for giving us your words of wisdom and inspiring the next generation of girls. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Yes, Sarah, do you have a few final parting words you'd like to say to our guests? Just thank you all so much for coming today and I hope you are excited about the future. <laughs> all right, well, I know I am. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sarah Kohler, for this wonderful talk today. So that is our Meet Your She Hero event for this Sunday afternoon. We've loved having you. We hope you look forward to our next one and, you know, check your emails because we send out our notices um, all the time. And we should be doing one um, not next month, but the month after that. So thank you again for coming and over and out. Until next time. Bye-bye. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye.